Uh, hello there and welcome into the very latest Bet U.S. College Basketball Show one more time for the week. It's the Friday before Christmas. It was the Friday before Christmas and all through the house, Corby Craig and Kyle Hunter are ready to make some handicapping plays. No, that did not rhyme. Good to be back with you boys uh, as we get ready for a barrage of Friday games that are basically going to finish up the weekend. Look at that. The number one fingers are already up like 30 seconds into the Ooh. show. Thank you for finding us however you have done so as we're ready to handicap some college basketball today. Uh, Kyle Hunter, you're back for a second consecutive day, a one-in-one -one day for you yesterday. Some thoughts on Thursday, including seeing Kentucky destroy Louisville last night in a game that wasn't even as close as the score indicated. By the way, as of 11 Eastern time when we're doing this live, Kenny Payne does not have Cole in his stocking, the Louisville coach. He is still the Louisville coach, apparently. Uh, Kyle, thoughts on that and anything else from a Thursday? Yeah, a couple, couple things. Um, I think uh, nobody could be shocked the way that Louisville was blown out there. And it's just got to be a matter of time, TJ. It can't be too long at all. And um, the, the games yesterday, I was surprised South Dakota and San Diego played a slow-paced game like they did. Uh, glad that Northern Colorado won outright. I know one of the viewers sent me a message and was like, hey, I took them on the money line. So that was cool. Uh, we got a win there. Left with a good call on that Houston, the double play. Uh, Houston yes. just absolutely dominates those teams that are not as good. I mean, they hold those teams in the 30s consistently. Um, you know, as far as other games, TJ, there weren't a lot of marquee games yesterday, but still some interesting games. Uh, Charleston beating St. Joe's. That was a good game. Yes. Um, you know, we've got a decent amount of games here to talk about again today. Looking forward to it. Corby Craig, I know you're back with us here uh, before the week is up, and you you have a grievance. You know, uh, the old Seinfeld, which is probably before your time, Corby, they had the Festivus, the airing of grievances. You have a grievance on a Friday before Christmas. What's going on? I do. First, I'll say uh, this is the this is probably the most fun show we've ever had, or at least I mean, I've been on what four shows at this point, and like the behind the scenes, all the way to the show after the show. This is this is great. Everybody in the chat. There's already 118 people watching TJ. So That's the number correct. one finger coming in three seconds in um, is deserving. So I, I've really enjoyed the show. But yeah, I have some grievance. Uh, everyone knows and everyone's heard of the Ewing theory. And, and damn it, it's the most annoying thing in history. So it, basically in college basketball or, or most sports, if the best player is out, somehow the other team just gets superpowers. I, Are I, you I making up? I don't know that I've ever heard it dubbed the Ewing theory. Are you making no, that up or that's actually a thing? It's a thing. I, I'm pretty sure it's a thing. If I've just made it up, then I'm the smartest guy alive, which. All right. <laughs> hey, but expound cool, but, on the Ewing uh, theory, please. Yeah. So so yesterday, <laughs> yesterday, Harvard's best player, Malik Mack. It's mono, the kissing, the uh, it was like they call that the kissing virus, uh, right. kissing too many people. And uh, <laughs> the best player by a factor of a lot for Harvard, he's out, beat the, beat the market to that news, get uh, under 142. Harvard and Holy Cross come out, TJ, mm -hmm. in a game that Holy Cross has never played pace in their life. In the in the first like four minutes, they hit five threes. At the end of the game, uh, 11 threes, nine threes. Two teams that really didn't shoot crazy good, but just the pace to start off the game basically set up the whole game. So Ewing theory bites me again. Malik Mack has mono. So if Harvard plays again in the next probably week and a half, two weeks, that's worth noting that he won't be there. But uh, also one more thing somebody brings up in the chat. Like a month ago, I talked about this UAB team sucking, and I circled a game, and you said far in advance we're circling games. That's today. Drake, UAB. We'll talk about that in the Q&A. Uh, oh, that is interesting. Game. Yeah, it's not on the sheet either, but uh, and by, have a circle. And, and by the way, the Ewing theory I thought was going to apply to that if you had Patrick Ewing, you go to the Final Four when Georgetown went to the Final Four three times in his four years and won one national title. In fact, they were in the title game three times in his four years. Did you know, loaded question, the only time Patrick Ewing was denied at Georgetown being in the Final Four, I'll give you boys three guesses and the audience who kept them out of the Final Four, beating them in the NCAA tournament. Kyle Hunter, you're, you're not smirking. You know, you know why I'm bringing it up. Who beat Georgetown? Why would I bring it up? Who beat Georgetown to keep them out of the Cor – Corby, Corby, the UAB. Ewing theory, not UAB. How about the Memphis Tigers, the then Memphis State Tigers, were the only team to beat Ewing, John Thompson's Georgetown, Sleepy Floyd, all of those guys, uh, and keep them out of the Final Four. Corby, look them up on YouTube, who we're talking about. Other than that, they were in the title game every year. Lost to Michael Jordan in North Carolina, won the title against Akeem in Houston, hello, and then the epic Villanova perfect game beat Ewing in Georgetown. So the Ewing, the Ewing effect is you were really good if you had Patrick Ewing. I'm just saying that on a uh, – 
on a Friday. All right, so we've already got a fun show uh, planned for you here. Let's take a look at the records. Two and two day yesterday, as Kyle mentioned, Jeff Nadu doubled up on Houston laying the big number and got it, and also live played uh, the opponent to be held under, what was it, 40 points, something like that, 45 points. He got the under as well, so he hit both of those. You see the show is now 20 games, 20 units above, 20 plays above, so well done to this point. All of that, again, is in the rearview mirror. What we care about is Friday and handicapping just before Christmas. Some holiday cheer, including for Marquette and Georgetown. This coming up on a Friday night in the Big East in Milwaukee. Marquette off of a loss where they were beaten decisively at Providence. Upset. Meantime, Georgetown, they hung in, but they lost at Butler. They have stayed out on the road. Let's get into the discussion here. Kyle Hunter, why don't you begin things here with the discussion on this Big East matchup, and are we going to see Marquette come out firing here tonight, angry off the loss at Providence? Well, what is uh, Georgetown? You know, we've talked about them a little bit before. They lost to Holy Cross at home, needed overtime to beat American. We're pretty fortunate to beat Merrimack. They could have beaten TCU at the same time, so they've been pretty inconsistent. I don't really know what I'm going to get out of Georgetown. They won at Notre Dame. Obviously, that win doesn't look as great when Citadel blows out Notre Dame. But, you know, still at Notre Dame, a decent win. Played decently at Butler. I do think Cooley will get it figured out here at Georgetown. He's definitely a really good coach. But there's a big talent differential. Um, Jaden Epps returned last game, which he's their best player. So uh, certainly helps him out quite a bit. Marquette off that ugly loss. It looks like it's a pretty good spot for Marquette. But, TJ, you saw the line, too. I mean, that's baked in. This is a really big price. Uh, it's hard for me to lay that many points. Uh, I would lean to the over in this one, thinking that Marquette will get the pace that they want to get here. And you know, like Georgetown's defense, they've given up a lot of points. Uh, other teams have been very efficient against them. So as long as Georgetown can score enough, I think this one can get over the total. Okay, Corby, we're joking around about the Ewing effect. Of course, he was the coach at Georgetown most recently, and they were awful, uh, especially a year ago where it was like a foregone conclusion at this time. Kind of like what Louisville is with Kenny Payne on when are they going to do it? Not if uh, if they're going to get rid of him, but when are they going to do it? All right, so maybe the Ewing effect here is that he's not there. Ed Cooley is now there. Again, Georgetown was beaten by 10 against Butler. What is your thought on that large line? And I don't think I went over the total. 150 is the total. Any thoughts here, Corby, on this matchup? Yeah, Epps coming back is huge for this Georgetown team. The main thing for Georgetown is they haven't been able to slow down a pace. Any, I don't really think that they want to, but like you look at the Syracuse game. Syracuse game closed 151 and a half. They scored 148 points combined, and Georgetown shot 19% from three. So though their offense isn't efficient, they still find ways to score points. Uh, Syracuse is not a team that I think is just a crazy athletic team, but it means Marquette significantly better. Uh, Georgetown struggles to score versus Marquette, a Marquette defense who is one of the best in the nation, forced a ton of turnovers. They don't turn the ball over any. Um, so I, I worry that Georgetown can't score, but lean towards the over pretty heavily here. I think Marquette is is one of the better teams in the, in the entire nation. They're ranked 15th for Ken Palm right now. I think that's a little generous. I, I feel like they're closer to a top 10 team. I, I know they just lost Providence uh, on the road. So, uh, I mean, Early in the season, I'm not too worried about what this team starts. It's rough that it's the first game in conference play and they lose it, but uh, this seems like a really good bounce-back spot for a Marquette team. Though, I don't want to lay 17 points, TJ. I mean, man, that's headed into the holiday season to lay 17. I, I would be curious what a first-half line is here. Right. Um, but but look uh, look towards the over. Maybe a Marquette first-half team total. Let's see the first-half line real quick. I can pull it up for you. And, it is and again. 10. 10 is the first half line. And again, yeah. this is a team that only scored 57 points the other night at Providence, had trouble shooting. They couldn't shake St. Thomas of Minnesota, which again, it was a one possession game with like a minute left. They beat them by five at home. That is a large number, 17 and a half uh, for this one uh, tonight. And again, Fox Sports 1 will have it at 6 local time, 7 Eastern time. Big East bounce back spot. I know a lot of the chat is saying stay away. Georgetown, you don't know what you're going to get out of Georgetown. Maybe they do bow up and hang in. Then again, maybe they roll over because, again, they stayed out on the road after the Butler game. But we gave you some good comments there on that matchup in the Big East. Let's continue. Friday night here involving Ohio and Austin P with Ohio as the road favorite laying four. The total is 138 in this matchup coming 
for uh, a Friday evening. And Corby Craig, you're going to begin the discussion on this with an official play. What drew you to this game, sir? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a common theme this week, TJ. I think everybody knows where I'm going. This one take the over 138 in Austin P, Ohio, which just sounds like it from an outside angle, like the most degenerate game you could ever bet. But let's get a quick breakdown of Austin P. Austin P is a team Corey Gibson coached. Um, Corey Gibson last year was Northwestern State coach. If you saw Northwestern State, they played pretty fast. Uh, they love to press. They love to trap and try to force turnovers. They don't have a ton of talent. I mean, it's it was Northwestern State, inevitably. They moved to Austin P. They basically transfer everybody from that team. They bring literally everybody over. Um, so they run the same press. The issue is last year where they were able to force tempo with their press. This year they're facing better teams. So they've really struggled. Like Moorhead State, 61 possessions. Moorhead really didn't struggle with that press by any means. Murray State, 57 possessions. Western Kentucky, 65. You continue to see teams that are just like, good enough to beat the press and then don't care to run fast. Murray State, a team that just doesn't want to run fast. Ohio, on the other hand, good enough to break the press, also doesn't care to slow the ball down. They're 150th in tempo. Uh, this is an Austin P team who they don't really have any players except for one kid. Demarcus Sharp is one of the best basketball players that no one talks about. He is 81 for 195 from two, but he ta- he is in the game for 95% of this game. He's fifth in the nation in, in Percentage minutes played, fifth in the nation of percentage of team shots taken, uh, a, a very high assist rate, low turnover rate. He is their entire team. So I, I don't worry of him being able to play ISO basketball and score. I think he's going to find his points. Um, and this is projected to be like 65, 66 possessions. I think Austin P really wants to play closer to 70. So uh, I, this is just a market idea that uh, this is a really slow team, and I don't think that's true. I think that they press, and the teams that they've pressed haven't really cared to speed up. So we see Ohio speed up here. Uh, giving an over 138. All right, again for Ohio, they are the road favorite. A couple people commenting on that in the chat for the Bobcats. Uh, A.J. Clayton has scored well for them. Again, they beat Defiance. They were defying Defiance. Uh, Defiance, Ohio, a smaller school, 108-28, to 28, an 80-point win uh, recently. They had losses to Marshall and Youngstown State before that. Any thought here, Kyle, including people talking about them being a road favorite in this situation, true road game for Austin P. Well, I think it's uh, interesting because, you know, it looks like Ohio is that team that uh, pushes the pace and Austin P slows it down. Like Corby said, it's it's kind of hard to tell if Austin P is legit uh, a slow-paced team or not. Uh, they're 339th in overall tempo so far this year. Ohio is 65th in average possession length. I think Ohio wants to run. And Austin P based on them having the coaching staff and the same players, I think they probably want to play quicker than what they have so far this year. Now, Ohio has played a really weak slate of offenses, so I think their defenses are their their defense is probably not as good as it looks on paper. Um, it's hard for me to know what the pace will be in this game, so I kind of laid off, but I think I would lean Ohio team total over here. I trust Ohio to score against uh, Austin P. The Austin P offense, like you know, I don't know what I'm going to get out of them. They have shot the ball pretty poorly outside of Sharp. And Sharp is kind of interesting because he's 6'3", but he almost never takes a three. He's shooting inside the, the paint quite a bit. Uh, both these teams are really short. Uh, interesting game. I'm surprised Austin P was so low scoring against uh, Western Kentucky, a really up and down team. So this one has me confounded a little bit. Also, I wanted to ask Corby, what's up with this taking all the overs all at once? Mm. You've been Mr. Over this week, Mr. Corby. What's going on? Ask ask in the Q&A. We can talk about it. (laughs) Okay. There's a tease for later on, he says. But Austin P tonight with Ohio just before Christmas. Let's see what happens in that matchup. A couple of more games to go. Hit that like button. Make sure you're subscribed. Get live questions ready here. We're here Monday through Friday. By the way, Savages, we are not here for Christmas. We are not here on the Tuesday after Christmas because there are not games. So we're good. Uh, We're entertaining, but if we don't have games to handicap, we'll hold off. We'll be back with you next Wednesday. So get it all in today for any of the action today or tomorrow, including out in Hawaii uh, as well with that tournament that we'll talk about. Uh, Meantime, let's swing all the way out west. We do our best to cover everything, including Fresno State and San Francisco, where uh, the USF on the West Coast lays 11 points. The total is 132 in this uh, matchup between uh, the Mountain West and the West Coast Conference. Uh, This is an afternoon game for San Francisco at five local time. 
Kyle Hunter, I'm right back to you for thoughts and an official play. What stood out on the slate of games here to have you uh, look the way of Fresno and San Francisco? PJ, I'm going to start by calling myself out. I had the San Francisco under myself the other day. They started 12 for 12 from the floor, six for six on threes. It was halfway through the first half and they hadn't missed a single shot. You know, when you go and check the game, it's like, oh, forget it. You know, this is ridiculous. It still barely went over because it was 91 to 51. Uh, but, you know, that hot shooting was too much. Uh, 34 points in the first 10 minutes for San Francisco. With San Francisco, if you look at them for the course of the season, their defense is way better than their offense. You know, this is a defensive team, 16th in the nation in defensive efficiency. And Justin Hudson's teams at Fresno have usually been a slow it down, win with defense. They're not very good on offense. Fresno has played a really weak slate of defenses, 332nd so far this year. So I think Fresno has a hard time scoring against San Francisco. And I'm banking on the fact that San Francisco – Probably doesn't make their first 12 shots from the floor today. If they do, you know, I'll be throwing something around over here or something. But, um, <laughs> you know, uh, both teams turn it over quite a bit. So I think there'll be quite a few wasted trips in this game. Uh, the efficiencies won't be too terribly high. And the preferred pace of both teams is pretty slow. So I think the number has been bet up a bit because San Francisco was so good the other day. I don't think we'll get that 91 point performance again. And I think they kind of regress back to the mean here in this one. I'm going to take under 132 here. So you said 12 for 12 to begin the day. Yeah. Tough to tough tough to replicate, including what did you say, six for six or five for five from three point six, range? Six and three. That is uh, tough to replicate. We shall see. Corby Craig, thoughts on Fresno State as a double digit uh, dog here coming in to play San Francisco, a team that you saw in person recently when they played Vanderbilt on the road. Any thoughts here? Yeah, this is a, a good segue into why I, I've been betting overs lately, too. But it's uh, it's the exact opposite for the spot. And I, I agree with the under uh, most teams this year. Um, I, I've taken like the deviations of of the final six minutes of blowouts. And basically, more than ever, teams are just trying to score points in the final. six. it, it doesn't matter how much they're up. They're not holding or letting off the gas. Basically, every team in the nation. Um, and it makes sense. Like, if you're talking from a transfer portal perspective, if you're talking from kids wanting to showcase their talent, they're just not slowing down like they have in years past. They don't care to just win the game. They care to blow teams out. I'll bring um, up so two good points. Can I interject? Kentucky yeah, yeah, was that way last night. They weren't making shots, but they were up by 22, and they were trying to score with three minutes left, two minutes left, still shooting threes, put the walk-ons in to shoot threes. And then I watched some of – uh, St. Mary's in Northern Kentucky. It was the same thing. That was a 30 point game the whole second half. And they were still trying to score with four minutes left, three minutes left shooting threes to your point. I'm just helping so, you on the Friday. It's, before it's been, Christmas. it's been a lot of teams in the nation. So now you see me betting overs because uh, these numbers, when a, a line is 12, they expect slowdown and there's not slowdown. But the one thing that plays perfect to this game is there's very seldom teams that do slow down. And San Francisco is 100% one of them. This Vandy line, uh, the Vandy total got up to 146, and in the final seven minutes, they basically tried to cook the clock. Yeah, Vandy scored nine points. San Fran scored 16 points in the final 10 minutes to go under the full game total by four points. It, it dropped basically the live line dropped basically 16 points. So this is a San Fran team who doesn't really care to run up the clock because, as Cal talked about, like they have shooters, uh, but they're so streaky. Like in that Vandy game, they shot, I think they hit five straight threes in the first half of that game. So they don't really care to try to run the clock because if they don't hit the shot, give the other team the ball. So uh, I don't think Fresno has enough to really make this game competitive. And if it's out of hand, San Fran doesn't care to run up the score. So uh, I like the under here. It would be my shaded way. But I think that's a, a very big note. And as you bring up TJ, it happens all the time. Like if you watch college basketball right now, teams are running up scores. And um, it is definitely worth noting right now or at least trying to still score. And that's dangerous when you are making plays in these games. But Kyle Hunter is on to something. Even though the Fresno Bulldogs had won some games, they lost most recently to Portland State in a 75-72 game. Kyle thinks under on this one. We'll lock him in officially on the under 132 for this matchup. One more game to go on our schedule, and then we will get to your live Q&A. Border war battle here, year in and year out, out of conference. This is a tremendous game. Illinois and Missouri about to get after it with uh, the line six and a half here for Illinois. We've seen uh, Illinois have a, a couple of good wins. We saw them lose at Tennessee. All right, I'm curious uh, for the thoughts. Kyle, you're right back for the official play here. 
with the total of 149 and a half. Are you thinking side? Or are you thinking total? What are you thinking? I'm going to stay with the total here. I, I've been on a nice run on sides here lately. I got to be careful with those because though, because I'm better at totals. So uh, we'll save those for one that I like better. I'm going to go with the under again here. TJ, you've been at this venue quite a bit, right? This is Enterprise Center in St. Louis. Uh, this is one of the it's best the, under It venues. is the downtown hockey arena where the St. Yeah. Louis Blues play hockey, but St. Louis also plays their games, the St. Louis Billikens, on this floor. Probably about an 18,000-seat downtown arena. Neutral neutral site for what it's worth, a little closer to Columbia and Missouri, but yes, on the neutral floor. Go ahead. This is a big place, uh, tough shooting backdrop. If you look at the games that have played there over the years, this is a very strong under gym, especially when it's smaller teams. So it's better when it's like the Missouri Valley Conference Tournament, when the teams are not used to playing in front of many fans and there's this huge venue. Um, but I still think it's a good one. If you go back, I looked this up before the show here today. The under 76 and 46 since 2008 in games played here. If you just bet the under in every single game, since 2008 played here, 20.2% ROI. So really good, just blindly betting unders. If you just start from that point, and then you say, okay, this is a big rivalry game, high intensity, both teams definitely care in a game like this. And Illinois is 15th in the nation in defensive efficiency. Missouri last year was really good on offense, ninth in offensive efficiency, but a lot of big losses. Uh, their big scores from last year, not there now. They're 67th in offensive efficiency this year. Missouri, 252nd in the nation in tempo. So you have a game that could be played at least relatively quickly, but not like blazing fast. Neutral game here in St. Louis, a pretty high total. I mean, I, you know, this is not necessarily two teams that I would just want to blindly bet unders with, but you're 149 and a half. So they can be relatively high and you still stay under this number. And we've got this great neutral site that has been uh, tremendous over the years. I'm going to take the under here in this one. Corby Craig, it's an Illinois team that lost early in the year to Marquette. Then they won at Rutgers in a Big Ten game on the road by double figures. They were very impressive in New York on the neutral floor beating FAU, Florida Atlantic. Tennessee handled them, though, in Knoxville. Terrence Shannon leads the way. What are your thoughts here? I know that uh, Kyle has a thought there on the underplay. What are your what are your thoughts about Illinois here? And maybe a little conversation on the side with the Illini. Yeah, this number is weird, uh, mostly because I don't like this Missouri team. I, I struggle to give Missouri any any real number. Uh, but I do think the Illinois tempo right now is pretty fake. 59th in the nation tempo. I don't think that that is true by any means. You look you look back a Colgate game. Colgate is a fast team. We've kind of seen this Colgate idea and offensive theory for years they hold them to 67 possessions because the game was kind of a blowout tennessee you see 74 possessions tj and, and everyone's gonna go man that is like so like that game was so fast it was 148 and a half total uh, i bet the under there it goes over because in the final 10 minutes the final score or the score in the final 10 minutes 27 to 26 the reason that possessions were so high in this game isn't because either team was playing fast it's because we've seen tennessee's scheme over and over 34 free throws, 28 free throws. Like the, the, the possessions happened because they were getting stopped halfway through and, and you give the other team the ball after you shoot free throws. Florida Atlantic, another game, 75 possessions, 26, 28 final 10 minutes. So it's, it's these games that like are still competitive in the final 10 minutes. So if you think Missouri is within three, four in the final 10, then like maybe this speeds up. Uh, but I think this is just a very fake tempo they've also played three teams outside of the top two uh, outside the top 250 basically they played them to 80 possessions 77 possessions 71 possessions and valpo southern and western illinois so they they have pushed pace in games that don't matter and the games that do have kind of been fake due to the fact that there's been fouling so uh, i don't think illinois wants to be 59th in the nation by any means i think they probably want to be closer to 100th so it would lean towards the under made this 147 and a half um so lean towards the under didn't bet it but uh, i do like that side Again, for Mizzou, they were beaten by who? My Memphis Tigers early in the year. They then got some wins. They beat Pitt. They beat Wichita State. They lost the rivalry game to Kansas. It was respectable, though. They hung in. They lost by nine. And then Seton Hall beat them in a close game where Missouri had a big comeback. A lot of scoring in that game, 93-87 in that game. All right, so it's Friday night. It's Illinois, Missouri, and Kyle says under. And good stat. Again, what is that stat all-time? 
just in the building for St. Louis games, neutral floor games, uh, Missouri Valley Conference tournament games. What's the stat on the under since 2008, Kyle? And TJ, this is on neutral site games, so it's not a home game for St. For Louis. For St. Louis, but if it's, okay, gotcha. If it's a neutral site game, it's 76 and 46 to the under, so really solid. Interesting on that, and it is a neutral floor game tonight. Crowd presumably split 50-50, Illinois. And Mizzou, that is 9 Eastern time tonight on Fox Sports 1. You see that we are here Monday through Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. We will, again, we will not be here Christmas. We will not be here on Tuesday because there are not games to handicap. When there are games, we'll be back on Wednesday and be raring to go with that. And this is one of the reasons why you want to be here live. You never know what to expect. All things college basketball. Nadu started preaching like end of the world type stuff yesterday at the very tail end of the show. You never know what you're going to get here, including Christmas. Uh, we're going to find out if Corby and Matt are done with the holiday shopping or not. We're going to, or uh, Cor- Corby and Kyle, excuse me, are done with the holiday shopping or not, or if they've even started. We'll find all this out in the Q and A. Let's get going. Take your guesses. <laughs> take your guesses. Make your bets. Uh, I'll take the under. I'll take the under. By the way, uh, Omida says James Madison. He starts on the Q and A. Says James Madison, twenty one and a half, uh, with a ten a.m. start West Coast time. Is JMU for real? He wants to know. Again, I'm looking for that's a that's a tournament correct, and I'm trying to find where that game is on the docket. But they are they are laying a big number. Go ahead with a thought on James Madison, and he asks, are they for real? I was supposed to bet the over in this game. I laid off, um, mostly due to how early the game is. Also, yeah, uh, Morgan State's it looks like best player. God, I, I suck at names. Quinn, <laughs> I don't know. Can't help you with it. Tabs. We're going to go with T-A-B-B-S. Tabs is his last name. Uh, right. He's out. Their, po- their point guard. Uh, he hasn't played the last two games. Uh, the game, the last game that he played, he scored 38 points. So I really don't want an over in a game that basically their best scorer is and out. It's a and mo- see- and shall we clarify, it's a Morgan State home game. They are playing at 1 Eastern time coming up. And JMU is still a 21 or 20 and a half point favorite. Just for clarification. Go ahead, Corby, and finish. Yeah, I was supposed to bet an over 160 and a half. Uh, I'm just going to lay off. Do the tab stuff. I, I I don't think my number is probably efficient relative to that, but I made this one sixty seven and a half. Um, so pretty pretty off. But uh, early game, best player out. I don't want any piece of this at all. The question is, Kyle, how legit is JMU? They won early in the year in that opening shocking win at Michigan State. They also have a couple of other wins, Old Dominion, but then they've beaten smaller schools like Hampton or Coppin State recently. Sleepy spot, is it not, here at 1, coming up here in a couple of hours? Yeah, I leaned the over to uh, Corby. My number was 165 here, and I looked at this one for a little while, and I'm just wondering if Morgan State can score enough to get to I mean, if you get up in those 160s, I try to find reasons not to bet it because it's just everything has to go right. And uh, with those injuries – uh, Morgan State, how many points will they be able to put up? And then James Madison, it being the last game before the break, they could shut it down. So I was definitely concerned to take an over. 21 is a lot of points, uh, TJ. I'm not excited to bet Morgan State without uh, looks like two of their top players missed the last game. So uh, it's just a game that I have to stay away from. Fair enough. Winston tabs, I believe, is what you're looking for, Corby Craig. They're on that. James Madison coming up early this afternoon for that matchup with Morgan State. All right, Mark is watching. He says, hey, fellas, Temple laying three and a half with Old Dominion. This is one of the consolation round games in Hawaii. Uh, Temple beaten uh, yesterday by Nevada. TCU demolished Old Dominion. We'll make mention here that the Old Dominion coach, Jeff Jones, the former Virginia player in the 80s, the former Virginia head coach, the former American head coach. He's the Old Dominion coach. Jeff Jones had a heart attack, no la- no laughing matter, had a heart attack on Wednesday in Hawaii, in Honolulu. He is hospitalized. Uh, he is in stable condition. They played, obviously, on last night with an interim coach situation. TCU beat Old Dominion badly. So these two teams are coming up Late morning, early afternoon, Hawaii time in a consolation round game where Temple's favored on the neutral floor. Any thoughts here, guys, including the total? Anything stand out, either Kyle or Corby, about this? I I would lean under. I mean, just because Old Dominion gave up so much yesterday, it's so easy to say, 
uh, you know, to give up 111 and easy over the next day. I would think if they have some pride here, they play a little bit better defense. And 83 possessions in that game yesterday, TCU plays extremely fast. Temple doesn't play that way. So I'm going to lean under. It's not the easiest bet to make, though. And again, Nevada beat Temple. Corby, anything on this? Again, they they hope that Jeff Jones can go home with the team later this weekend off of the three games they're going to play. This is the second of the three games that they're playing today, but still hospitalized, obviously, for the next couple of days in Honolulu while they care for him after a scary situation out on the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, anything on this game? Temple, Old Dominion. Yeah, it's it's really deep in the weeds. Um, but I, I watched that Temple Old Dominion or I watched the Old Dominion TCU game last night. Um, mm-hmm. There were so many fouls that were not fouls, TJ. Like it, it, it pains me to watch when this kind of stuff happens. And the only reason I note that I don't really care about past experience. Sorry for the car in the background, but uh, don't care about past experience. But they're in Honolulu, so I'm assuming there's two sets of refs. One that ref the last game last night, uh, Nevada temple and then the one that ref tcu game so if you have the tcu refs by no means would i ever bet this under and if it's the ref set that did the <laughs> temple nevada game i i would lean towards the under they, they were really good refs so it was just a normal basketball game if and any, we don't know they, for sure but you bring up a good point how many officials can you get to the islands how many are there there probably is a third crew that they're rotating in sense. and around but just keep it keep an idea uh, on this for the Temple Old Dominion game. And again, in that tournament, somebody may ask about these games. Let me get my semifinals right. TCU and Nevada are playing in this Hawaii hosted tournament in the Stan Sheriff Center. They're playing this afternoon, um, I believe, five Eastern time, noon local time that they're playing. Hawaii will not play until later tonight, Hawaii time, 11 Eastern time. Hawaii plays Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech won late. Last night with Damon Stoudemire, Hawaii won the last game of the four games on uh, Thursday. So Hawaii, Georgia Tech comes off one of the last games of the night, maybe the last game of the night. 11 Eastern time, six local time. Winners play in the championship game between TCU, Nevada, Georgia Tech, and Hawaii. Will Hawaii be in the title game? Remember, we talked, I still remember this, guys. We talked a bunch about the, uh, the Hawaii Rainbows had never won the tournament, had never as the host won the tournament, and they won a year ago, and it was a rocking atmosphere for the championship game. Let's see if uh, if they get a win tonight, late night over Georgia Tech, and maybe that'll come up in our Q&A. Let's move on. C. Vaughn, a member watching us. Thank you, C. Vaughn. He says, SMU laying six today. Murray State defense stinks. The SMU defense can probably throw their attack off. Any thoughts on the side? Corby, anything on SMU and the side? Yep, completely agree. Uh, you can find five, five and a halfs now. Uh, SMU should should do pretty well. This total has got steamed up four points at this point. Uh, I think that leans towards the idea that SMU basically dictates this game. Uh, I was supposed to bet the over at 138. I'm not betting it at 142, basically. Um, but for this to be steamed up four points, like it's not steamed up because they think Murray's going to set the pace. Murray's one of the slowest teams in the nation. So um, it's the idea that SMU is able to do what they want. So lean towards SMU and the over for sure. Kyle Hunter, the CFSB Center in Murray, Kentucky, is where this one is. Again, it's a uh, 6 Eastern Time CBS Sports Network game with uh, Murray with a losing record. Any thought here? SMU, should they roll in this one as a road favorite? Um, I'm this devil's advocate. Uh, I think Murray State, you're probably like selling them at, at the low if you sell them now. Though. That's my concern. They've played so bad lately. Um, you can't fade them. Laying six with SMU on the road. Do I really want to bet Murray? No, but I just feel like you might be a little bit too late if you're trying to just fade Murray now. Fair enough. Let's go to Easy Baby 1988. He's also a member. He's got a question for Corby Craig. He says, Drake, UAB, side and total, please. You have been pointing to this, circling it on the calendar. <laughs> Thought, please, on that. Yeah, go ahead. Cor- for quite some time, the issue here, um, injuries. Again, I don't want to try to say this guy's name, but Tucker DeVries, maybe? I don't know. Uh, Drake's best player. He's He's been there for a minute. Um, he I think it's been DeVries. Out. I think it's DeVries, DeVries but go ahead. Okay. He missed the last game versus uh, Alcorn, and he has a shoulder is- issue. And um, th- not really sure if they're going to play. I know Andy Kennedy is expecting him to play. They, they practice as if he's going to play. Um, but I... I'm going to try to get some information in, in like the first set of warmups, see if he practices like normally through warmups uh, and, tr- and try to beat the market to that information. If he plays, 
I circled this in November, and I will guarantee that I would be betting Drake if he is in. I don't think UAB is good. Um, when I when I circled this, I was really hoping that UAB would smack around Southern Miss. They would smack around Arkansas State. They'd smack around Alabama AM. and m Three that they very easily should have done. Um, they didn't do any of that. They went one and two, and they didn't cover versus Alabama AM. So I do think this number is a little bigger than I was hoping. But I think Drake wins by six, seven, eight, pretty easy. UAB's off for Christmas break. Like there will be no humans in that stadium, so not worried about that. Like I, if I, I'm going to go, and I will, you will see me in the crowd. So like it, it will just. Are be you? I mean, me I see probably. it's two local time, three Eastern time. Are you making your way to the Barto Arena for UAB oh, yeah. and this? Oh, yeah, uh, and I'll this be showdown see, here with Drake. I'll, Drake is eleven I'll, and one. People, Drake is eleven and one. Good team. I will be there as early as I can, TJ. I'm trying to see if uh, Tucker's going to play. And if he's in, I will tweet it. Uh, or if he looks good in warm-ups, I guess like, I would never know if he's in. But if he's good in warm-ups, like the early warm-ups. See, you're learning. Violence. You're learning. These these teams, yeah. they love to have them warm-up. They, you know, they Ewing go through effect. the full warm-up, and then they sit and watch. And so, probably doesn't, who knows? Probably doesn't even matter anyways. You and Effect, this. if he's in, he's going to not do good. If he's out, then their bench former is going to score 40. So, uh, Drake or nothing for me. Kyle, it is a total of like, what, 152, 152 and a half. Any thought on Drake UAB on the total? Not really. I mean, I would lean Drake here. So I'm going to be watching for Corby's live tweeting of this one. So uh, I'm on hold till Corby uh, reports back. M. Caesar watching. And again, we get a lot of the same questions because these people are members. They're going to move up on the list. Join, be a member. You get ranked higher in the priority on the Q&A. M. Caesar wants to know from Kyle, what's the best under stadium or arena in college basketball? Uh, is it a neutral site? Thought on uh, historically, you've talked about the garden before uh, as one to watch. I don't know about historical unders there, but thoughts? Yeah, Madison Square Garden would be first for me, uh, especially if you look at first half unders at MSG. They've done so well. People have to get used to the shooting backdrop there. It's massive. Uh, it's a little bit darker than some of the other places. The other one I would say is the one that we talked about today there in St. Louis. So those would be my top two as far as neutral site unders. And you guys, you could do a lot worse than just taking blind neutral site games under the total because Neutral site totals have done much better to the under than regular home venues. All right, uh, fair enough. I, I was thinking like Bridgestone Arena in Nashville where they play some yeah, different games, one. including the SEC tournament. Anything about that one as a it's, under arena? It's definitely one of the best. Um, pointed it out when we were talking about the St. Louis one earlier, the best is when you have these small teams that are used to playing in the tiny places, go play in like Bridgestone or Enterprise or something like that, or MSG. Um, if it's really big teams already, you know, Kentucky goes plays in Bridgestone. It doesn't mean anything to Kentucky. They're used to playing in these massive places. So uh, you want like the, uh, I remember the big West tournament used to be held in the Honda center in California. Mm -hmm. That one had done really, really well to the under, then they switched where they had it and made it a smaller place. I was pretty upset, but you know, these are the type of things that, you know, a dork like me gets upset about. Don't call yourself a dork on this close to the holidays. You're just thorough. You're diligent. Uh, let's see. Dalton watching says thoughts on Mississippi Valley and the team total under 48 and a half. We Mississippi Valley state has been a topic uh, here on the show previously. He's interested in the team total staying under. And guys, I got to be honest, I'm scanning through what is my matchup on Mississippi Baylor. Valley to be held under. Go ahead. Baylor. Um, and that's tough. Like, I mean, that's uh, <laughs> Baylor's given up that over that number every game except one this year, it looks like. They gave up 40 to Northwestern State. Northwestern State, very comparable to Mississippi Valley. So I do get the idea. Um, watching Mississippi Valley play, which, Jesus. Help me, I've done way too many times at this right. point. Um, they are very slow. The issue is they've played like the best team. I, I bet they're one of the hardest strength of schedules in the nation. So um, I don't know. Baylor kind of wants to run up the score. We've we've seen this Baylor team put up 90 in games that they shouldn't have. The, the teams that Mississippi Valley has played so far, they didn't. Like, Gonzaga only played 65 possessions. So they kind of just slowed down and, and didn't really try to, to cram them. 48.5. I would lean towards the under, but I, I mean, if this was like 52, I'd be very happy. But uh, 40 and a half, I mean, man, that's, <laughs> it, 
it's not fun. There is a school of thought, Kyle Hunter, that Baylor off the loss to Duke the other night, beaten badly last Saturday in Detroit by Michigan State, that they may come out just firing in this game. But the viewer's question was, does Mississippi Valley State care? Do they keep up? Do they score? No, I think uh, Mississippi Valley just kind of realized how bad they are and just started stalling like crazy because at the beginning of the year, they played a 75 possession game against LSU, lost 106 to 60. And then you look at their recent games, they scored 39 on Liberty, 48 on North Texas, 40 on Gonzaga, only 50 against Tulsa, not a great defense. And they're actually dead last in average possession length now. So they are just absolutely stalling. I would lean under this, and I think Baylor probably just absolutely blows them out here. All right, that game coming up at 6 local time in Waco. Let's continue with Jenna with a question. She says, hi, men. Hi, Jenna. Please tell me my Maryland Terps plus the three and a half figured out tonight and beat UCLA. Happy holidays to all. UCLA angry guys off the loss to Cal State Northridge. They let Northridge come into Pauley Pavilion and beat them earlier in the week. This is off of losing at the neutral site game against Ohio State last Saturday. Is UCLA raring to go, or what's up here? Any thought, Kyle, anything on this? I mean, I'm sure UCLA is actually even decent because in UCLA, Ohio State played really bad in that game against UCLA and won. They didn't make a three until there were like 30 seconds left in the game. And UCLA, I think Cronin's a good coach, definitely. So they'll play hard for him. The question is, you know, I, I don't know. I don't trust Maryland on the road that much because we've seen their home road splits in the past. The under is probably what I would take. I'm curious what Corby thinks on the total here because this total has gotten bet up quite a bit, seeing 131 some places, even going above that. So this is now above my number, and that's what I would lean in this game. Uh, Corby Craig, any thought here? Maryland has struggled offensively as well. Short favorite situation for UCLA in this game. Yeah, I've talked about Maryland all year. This is my least favorite team in college basketball. Uh, just relative, relative speaking, I, I don't think they're 78th. I don't think they're 100th. Um, this team is not good. If Jameer Young and Julian Reese are your two leading scorers, you're in a lot of trouble. The issue is, who are UCLA's leading scorers? Like, I, right. I, I couldn't tell you much about this team. I don't think this team really has any. They've had a couple of injuries. Like, One of the yeah. freshmen played well against Northridge, but not well enough. They let Northridge outplay them in the last 10 minutes of being Cal State Northridge had not beaten a Pac-12 team of any kind in 12 years. They won at Pauley Pavilion and snapped UCLA's 29-game home win streak. Will the Bruins be angry? Do they have enough firepower? We'll find out. We'll find out coming up 6 local time, 9 Eastern time, ESPN2 for that game. Let's continue. Is it Jyothi? I think I have this right. Jyothi wants to know about Albany and USF, South Florida and Tampa, the other USF that's playing this afternoon. Bulls and Albany, what are they, the Great Danes, I believe. It is a lot of points. Any thought here, Kyle? Uh, USF last night in football. That was quite the performance. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, yeah, or you could say the other way around from Syracuse primarily. But um, I looked at the over in this game. I think the pace will be really quick. You know, Albany is really bad defensively. They're playing really quick. The problem is USF, I don't know what to get. you're going to get from them on offense. They've had some really bad performances on offense. Then they put up a ton of points against Florida State. I've had some right. good ones. I think, I think USF's well coached, so I expect them to get better throughout the course of the season. And um, I, I just lean to the over here in this one. As far as the side, I think Albany's played such a weak schedule that I don't want to trust them in this spot. Corby Craig, the Bulls did score 88 on the neutral floor in Miami a couple of weekends ago. They came back home and scored 104 on Pine Bluff. We've talked about Arkansas Pine Bluff not having very much. But then they got 77 last Saturday afternoon against Loyola of Chicago. This is a Friday afternoon, maybe sleepy, um, Selton Miguel is the outstanding scorer for the first year coach, Amir Abdur Rahim. Miguel is a good three point shooter when he's on. What about this here? Albany is getting a lot of points. Anything real quick? Do we have a bet US number on this by chance? I'm trying to pull it up. Uh, for I haven't total? seen it, but it's 11 or 11 and a half, I think, everywhere. For a total, go ahead. sorry. Um, so oh, I'm sorry on the total, yes. Yeah, you're good. Um, so South Florida, I'm trying to be quick. South Florida um, has been steamed up basically in every single game that they've played towards the over. This is a team that market really likes the over. And as of, let's see, that was four minutes I'm seeing ago. like 151 and a half, 151 so, or 151 and a half. 
So as of basically four minutes ago, I got steamed up two points on Pinnacle. Um, so if I could get a 151 and a half, I would take it over here. Um, if we can get it for the show, I'll do a live bet. But uh, I, I think this is a South Florida team that market loves you over, and they have every single time that they've played basically since the Florida State game. Um, and an Albany team that has no defense and plays 11th in the nation pace. So if we can get a 151, I'll take that. Um, if not, all good. I, I, I lean heavy towards the over. I will be betting it myself. So. All right, let's continue a couple more real quick. Uh, Jake watching. Does Clemson laying 21 and a half whoop Queens today? This is six Eastern time on Clemson's home floor. Any quick thought on that with Clemson laying a huge number? It's one of those games right before break. Students aren't really there. I don't really like laying this many points. It'd be a sleepy spot. I don't think Queens is going to be able to keep up with them really, but uh, I don't know. Would you argue that this is a good bounce back spot for Clemson off the loss to Memphis, or you just think this is a sleepy spot going into the break? And that just not a game that I, I really have much of a feel for. I see it blinking. Stay away. Stay away. Corby, anything? You want to stay away also? I have Clemson futures win the championship, and I I still wouldn't even bet this. So by all means, stay away from me. Gray Shade says Auburn laying thirty one and a half. Good time for a beat down. Any thought on Auburn from either of you? for Friday. This feels like the same type of question to me. I mean, I don't know as Auburn motivated to win by this. I have a hard time laying these huge numbers. Who is the opponent? These. Forgive me. It's such an onslaught of games. Who's the Auburn opponent? If we Auburn even know playing Alabama state from the swag. So, okay. I'm going to pass here. Pass on that Corby, anything or pass. Uh, pass. Auburn can run up score because they play 12 guys, but uh, pass overall. I have I have one question if we can find it. This Daisy person has put question marks in the chat for like the last 10 minutes. Did we get their question? I don't uh, know. Well, I'll I go in order uh, because we yeah, have an yeah. order. Daisy, cool. be All a right. member. You get ranked higher. Here we go. Uh, K&D Golf uh, is asking about the Hawaii semifinal with TCU and Nevada. Again, they both won in blowout fashion. Both won by more than 20 in the quarterfinal game. So now TCU in Nevada, neutral floor in Hawaii. He's interested in the total, 150 and a half, something like that. Any thought, guys, on that? Over, lean over. The lean is over. Corby, anything on that? TCU scored 111, I believe, last night. Agree, and uh, also lean TCU pretty heavy. I think TCU is really good basketball. I I bet them to make the final four. Uh, I like this team, so TCU. Uh, uh, Daryl, if I have it, anyone got an opinion on George Mason and Tulane? The uh, George Mason Patriots. Uh, Don't know the number. He's saying laying four. Are you curious on the total as well? Total, I'm assuming, is, yeah, 158. Uh, Tulane's been steamed up every single game as well. It's too big of a number. Tulane, uh, yes, they play really fast, but George Mason doesn't really care to. Uh, Under 158 and a half, that's, that's, it's getting a little ridiculous at this point. Kyle, anything on Tulane and George Mason? We're all over the map on the show. Anything? I think I'd probably lean Tulane here. I trust Tulane's offense, the way they've been aggressive. They're getting to the line at an extremely high rate, first in the country. Um, George Mason probably has a hard time keeping up, I would think. And again, that matchup is on Tulane's home campus at one local time coming up. Who did Tulane have the double overtime thrilling game? I'm going back to look for that one. It was Furman. Incredible game, 117-110 that they had recently. Then they turned around and scored 100 in regulation on Southern on this floor. We'll see if Tulane can put up some more uh, big points. Did we leave anything out? Um, I think we are good. Did we leave any other significant game out before we have to say goodbye on a Friday? I know Kansas is in action uh, tonight, and I saw a couple of other ones that might be of interest, including teams later, Kansas with Yale at 7 local time. Kansas is favored by 11.5 in that one. And other than that, we did mention Hawaii and Georgia Tech. Hawaii is a short favorite with Georgia Tech in the late-night game in Hawaii. Anything else? I would go um, – so i am just give like a precautionary number if it, if it happens. So I'm, we're not going to be on air for the Tucker DeVries – Info, I'll try to post on Twitter, but uh, if nobody sees it, if you see that he's this playing. This is the player from Drake from earlier in the show. Yeah. If you're just joining us, you're curious if he's warming up. But what do I warn you about, young Jedi? Yeah, just because saying, he's warming up doesn't mean he's going to play in the yeah, game with so, UAB this afternoon. So so if it's like news that he's playing, uh, Mark is probably going to move right. point, point, point and a half. Um, I'm fine with playing under 
five. Like, if it's if it's if he's in for sure, and, and it's Drake minus five, I would I would play five. So uh, be looking out for that number. If you have a live number early, anything under five is fine with me. Some tremendous advice. We thank you to all the savages uh, participating with the live questions, and uh, all throughout the month of December so far as the audience has continued to grow. Here's the best bets. Here's what the guys are on officially. One final show before Christmas. Kyle's got two underplays, Fresno and San Francisco, and then Illinois, Missouri, and the rivalry game in St. Louis. Corby says over for Ohio and Austin P. We have to go momentarily. Uh, do you guys fool around on Christmas Eve or even on the Saturday before Christmas with going out and shopping? Is all the shopping done? Corby, point blank, shopping is done? This is the first year I've ever bought gifts for everybody. I uh, I hit and immediate it's done? and secondary family. Oh yeah, killed it. It's done. Kyle Hunter, are you done or are you still picking things over tomorrow and Saturday and Sunday? I'm done, but I definitely don't go to the mall. Anything through yeah, Amazon, mall, I'm not fine. I don't, I don't leave yeah, this Amazon mall. does help. The mall has become uh, ridiculous. Uh, I am not done. I'm venturing out later today. God help me with finding a parking space and, and the patience with all that's going on. Is Die Hard a Christmas movie? The great action Bruce Willis movie with the hostages in the Nakatomi Tower. Christmas movie, Kyle Hunter, yes or no? I, I don't know. I, I try to stay out of this one, TJ. I just uh, We watch Home Alone and Home Alone 2 with the kids <laughs> constantly over here. So I'm, I just, not uh, saying, I'm not saying watch Bruce Willis shooting up the terrorists with the kids. Yeah. I'm saying, is it a Christmas movie? Corby Craig, do you have an opinion? Never even seen the movie, so I'm going to go with see no. it. Go get we Die Hard. Go, go, go on Netflix. Go wherever. Get the $2.99 digital rental and watch Die Hard, or I'll send you my DVD. It's tremendous. Thank you. Uh, Tis the season with Die Hard. I know it was before your time. You're making me feel old. Boys, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays, everybody. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Kyle Hunter. Thank you, Corby Craig. He's scooting off, I think, for UAB and Drake. Again, Drake 11-1 and one playing UAB this afternoon. No show Monday or Tuesday because of the Christmas holiday. We're back on Wednesday. Uh, thanks to Kevin, all the staff, everybody behind the scenes. If you enjoy the great graphics and everything that goes on here with BetUS TV, yes, the number one fingers are up. Thank you. We thank you for watching. We'll see you midweek next week. Thanks for joining in. Don't forget to like our video. If you don't want to miss our next show, make sure to ring our bell and subscribe. For all our sports content, head to BetUSTV.com 